Hello everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Haley. There are two things that I need to address before we get into today's video. I got called out for using a filter during the filming of my first two videos. Um, the reason this person called me out is because they said that I wasn't giving the true look of the makeup. Um, so I, so that's why there's two things I have to address. So the first thing I'll address is the makeup. Um, if you are an esthetician, a beauty guru, an influencer, or somebody looking um, to learn how to apply makeup, this is not your channel. This is not a channel for you. Um, the reason I incorporated makeup into this channel is because I enjoy doing makeup, but by no means do I know what I'm doing. I'm still learning how to apply makeup myself. I'm still learning what works and what doesn't work. Um, I'm, in, I'm by no means any kind of expert. Um, if you wanna watch a true crime series and see some great makeup application at the same time, I would recommend you go see Bailey Sarian, who talks about true crime and puts her makeup on, and she is a makeup artist. I am not a makeup artist. Um, so I put makeup in this channel because I wanted to do, I wanted to create a YouTube channel that I enjoyed and that um, had my interests in it. and. I felt that makeup lightened the mood a little bit um, because talking about missing children can be extremely um, sensitive um, and it's easy to fall down the rabbit hole. And I felt that with the makeup, um, it would cause a little bit of a distraction and kind of make a level playing field. The second thing that I want to talk to you about is the filter that I use. Um, you don't know me and I don't know you, um, but I am suffering from a disease called hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is when your thyroid is too slow and it affects many things in your body. Um, some of these things um, are puffiness of the face. So I'm, um, and I am experiencing these side effects because unfortunately, um, Finding the right level of medication um, takes a lot of time. So you have to start at the lowest point of medication. You have to wait six weeks, you have to get your blood work taken. They then increase the, the uh, medication. You wait six weeks to get your blood work taken. And they can only go up in increments of five. So I'm still not at the level that I need to be at. So I still suffer from some of the things that hypothyroidism um, gives, like a puffy face. And I have a lack of confidence from, from that. Um, I never had this before. Um, I've been struggling with this disease for about two years. Um, I saw my face swell up like a balloon and I lost a lot of my confidence and um, I lost a lot of, of um, you know, yeah, that, that confidence in myself that I was beautiful. So I didn't think that anyone would care if I used a filter while I videotaped my stories, um, because we weren't here to look at the makeup, we're here to listen to the story and the makeup is just a side thing that goes with it. Um, so I felt more confident using a filter that slimmed my face um, because I don't like the way that I look and I'll be honest with you. Um, and that's because of my disease. I look this way, I have all this because of my disease. And when the medication gets stable and I'm on the right dosage, we will see a loss of um, the puffiness and um, the water weight that I have. Um, but until then, it's a journey. Um, you'll also notice that my hands shake a lot. That's another side effect of hypothyroidism. Um, so I'll be you know, applying my makeup and my hands will be shaking while I'm not nervous. It's just, that's something that hypothyroidism does as well. And it makes putting a uh, liner on lashes on um, extremely difficult, which is why I always go off camera because it always takes me like 30 to 40 minutes to get that done. So that's why I was using that filter. That's why I was using a filter in general. But I decided for this video, um, I would take the filter off and I would just do the raw video of me. And I hope you can appreciate that because that took strength and courage for me to do. And without further ado, 
I will open it up to the video for this Sunday. Hello here, future self. Just wanting to pop in a little disclaimer. Warning, the contents you're about to hear are extremely graphic and sexual in nature. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. So today we have a doozy of a story. Um, absolute uh, intense, full on intense uh, story. Um, and we're going to be talking about a little boy and his name is Ethan Pats. Pats is his last name. Okay, little boy. Ethan Pats was born October 9th, 1972 to parents Julie and Stanley Pats. Um, he has been missing since May 25th, 1976, which would have made him six years old at the time. So Ethan disappeared um, on his way to school. So it was believed that Ethan had been abducted at his school bus um, every, every morning uh, he would take the bus to school and that's what they believed um, happened to him. Now I'm not aware, I'm not sure if they still do it, but um, back in the 80s um, and the 90s, I believe, um, they would, they had the missing children on the milk cartons. Um, it was actually Ethan's disappearance that helped launch the missing children movement, um, which included new legislation and new methods for tracking down children. Whoop, I didn't contour on my face there. A little bit distracted. There we go. Um, so several years later, after Ethan's disappearance, he became the, one of the first child, one of the first children to ever appear on the milk carton boxes. And in 18, or sorry, 1983, President Ronald Reagan designated May 25th as National Children's Day in the U.S. Um, and sadly, Ethan's disappearance went unsolved for many decades. So in 2010, the case was reopened by the Manhattan District uh, Attorney Office. And they worked on the case continually. Um, and 2012, they actually thought that they had um, the crime scene located. So in 2012, they thought that they had the crime scene located and they excavated the basement um, in order to try and find Eaton's uh, body, but unfortunately they recovered uh, nothing. So I have the entire full story for you and here's how it goes. Um, May 25th, 1976. Ethan, Ethan was walking to school uh, or to the bus stop for the first time um, in his life that he'd ever been able to do it. Um, the bus stop was two blocks away from the family's Soho house. Um, so the mother felt confident enough to let him uh, walk to school. Um, he was wearing a black pilot cap that said future flight captain, blue jeans, blue corduroy jacket, uh, blue sneakers with fluorescent stripes on them. Um, 
at school, a teacher noticed that he was missing, but she failed to tell the principal. So it wasn't until he didn't return home that um, local authorities were contacted. Julie, the mother, um, immediately called the police when he didn't return home. Um, and an intense search began. There were around 100 officers and a bloodhound unit that were dispatched, and they continued for weeks to search for him, putting up missing posters everywhere and just had absolutely no leads. In 1995, attorney Stuart R. Garbos, Grab Grabois, I, I don't want to say it wrong, Grabois, I believe that's pronounced, um, he received the case. Um, and he identified the suspect as Jose Antonio Ramirez. So Ramos was already a convicted uh, child sexual abuser. Um, and uh, he was also a friend of the babysitter of Ethan. Ethan. In, so you have to understand that in 1982, jumping back a little bit, multiple boys accused Romas of trying to lure them into a drain pipe um, near where Romas was living. When they searched um, the area back in, now we're jumping ahead in 1995, I know, complicated, bear with me, um, they found photos of Ramirez with a boy who looked quite similar to Eaton. Okay, so I'm gonna hop off camera and I'm gonna do my liner and my lashes, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna finish this story. Um, it gets really crazy, I promise. So uh, I will be right back. All right, so remember I told you about Ramos um, and the photographs and so on and so forth. Well, Grabois later found out that he had actually been in custody in Pennsylvania um, in connection with an unrelated child molestation case. Um, so in 1990, Garbros actually became a deputy um, and he went and he questioned Ramos. Um, and at first, um, Ramos denied everything, um, but then he stated that he had taken the young boy um, to rape him and that he was 90% sure that it was the boy that he had seen on the TV, the TV being um, eaten. But he claimed he put that boy on the subway and said that he never killed him and that he left um, alive. Now, in 1991, Ramos was incarcerated. And while he was incarcerated, he um, spoke to one of his inmates, like a confidant, um, and he confessed to murdering the little boy, and he even drew out a, a map of the school bus route, which was something that wasn't made known, um, to the public at all at any point, um, and the jailhouse, um, confidant came forward and told, um, Grabios, Grabois, sorry, uh, that name is difficult to pronounce, um, and told an FBI agent, um, of course. So the New York Times went on to feature the story of Etans, and they named Ramos as the primary suspect at the time, um, and, and in his, involved in his disappearance. Um, Ramos was a suspect um, all along, but unfortunately there was never any evidence um, in order to put him away um, from like 18 or 1980 up until um, 1999 when they did the feature. Um, so he was still out 
loose in the area. Um, you know, who knows what he was up to? Uh, probably not good stuff. Uh, but Ramos was never criminally prosecuted. Um, and he continued to deny the fact that he had actually killed Eaton. Now, let me tell you a twist. May 24th, 2012, the New York police claimed that they had a man in custody who admitted to killing Etam. 51-year-old Pedro Hernandez stepped forward. He confessed to the police that he lured Eaton into a convenience store basement and promised him a soda. He then went on to state that he choked Etan and put him in the garbage. Pedro would have been 18 at the time this occurred. December 2012, Pedro pleaded uh, not guilty and it was brought to the court's attention that he had schizophrenia that would sometimes make him hallucinate. Um, he also had like a below average IQ. The lawyer tried to get his case dismissed, um, but it was rejected. So May 2015, the case was deadlocked due to a hung jury. Frustrating as heck. Uh, it was 11 to one. That's what it was. Um, uh, so a retrial began October 19th, 2016. Uh, deliberations were February 2017. And he was found guilty for kidnapping uh, and fel a felony for murder. Uh, on February 28th, Pedro was given 25 years to life. However, his lawyers were granted a delay to challenge that verdict. But justice was served because April 18th, 2017, Pedro received life in prison with a chance of parole after 25 years. And given that he was almost 60 when he went into jail, well, rest assured, he probably won't be getting out. Uh, so that is the tragic case of E. Tim. Um, you know, <laughs> such a difficult thing when your child is six and it was his first time walking to school and that happens that's just a tragedy um i've my heart goes out to that entire family um you know i uh i can't i can't imagine um but so much good start so much good came out of it um, you know, with the, the new ways that they look for missing children, the National Children's Day, the milk carton, um, becoming a popular thing. I don't know if they still do that. In Canada, we don't do that. I don't know if you still do that in the States. Um, but that is the tragic case of, of Eaton. Um, rest in peace. Um, so... Uh, that's all I've got. Um, I will see you next Sunday. Um, I hope that you um, take into consideration that I hear you. I hear your comments. I know what you're. I can hear what you're saying, and I, uh, I, uh, I, um, I listen. I listen, and uh, and I love you all. So take care, <laughs> and I'll see you next Sunday.